podcast. Daphne oh, getting wetter. We ain't going out to film anything. All right. Let's continue on. So, do EVs go through brakes too quickly? No. Categorically, no. In fact, most EVs have a problem of brakes seizing up through not being used rather than going through them too often. We have brakes and we have brake pedal, obviously. But the brakes we use more than anything is something called regenerative braking. With a normal car, you accelerate up to, let's say, 50 miles an hour. And at that speed, you have something called inertia. Your car now is moving at 50 miles an hour. And if you want to stop it, you have to get rid of that energy. And in a normal car, you will press your brake pedal. That will produce pressure in a pipeline with a hydraulic fluid. And that will close a caliper with brake pads, friction brake pads, onto a disc. That will turn the kinetic energy of movement into heat. Your brake pads get hot. It's a transfer of energy. So it will turn your kinetic energy into heat and that will slow you down. With an electric car, we do the opposite. We turn that kinetic energy into electricity. So we will use the motors to turn the kinetic energy into electricity and that electricity feeds back into the battery and it charges the battery up. So we don't use brake pads in the same way. So when we slow down, we just recharge the battery. It's a really simple system. It's all automatic. You don't need to think about it. If you press your brake pedal in a, an EV, in most cases, it will actually just use the regenerative braking to charge your battery. And that means that we don't use the brake pads the same. If in an emergency you need to slam on the brakes, it will use both regenerative and your brake pads. So it's always there, but for most cases we use regenerative. And that's the reason why my car is coming up to 90,000 miles, it's nine years old. I'm still on the original brake pads and because the brake pads aren't being used, it's still on the original discs. So we don't use our brake pads anywhere near as much. Because we don't use them, there is a real risk of the brake pads, the calipers, seizing up through lack of use. So it is recommended in the handbook that every so often that we press our brake pedal a bit harder than normal just to keep the brake pads moving. But mine, at nearly 90,000 mile, is still on the original brake pad. So no, we don't use brake pads anywhere near as much as a normal petrol car does. And this is a, a very fast two-ton heavy EV. When you look at how quickly technology moves on, we see this with smartphones, where a smartphone from five years ago feels almost ancient. Is there a real risk that EVs will age quite poorly due to their dated, antiquated software? Um, yes, to a certain degree, although like a smartphone, uh, you can do software updates. This one has regular software updates. So what you find with a smartphone, for example, is it just becomes out of date with the hardware. So the camera can't be updated if it's a 20 megapixel camera. That's what you've got. And software can't make it any better. Um, but you can do what they call firmware updates, which will improve an awful lot of the functions of the smartphone. That's the same with cars, um, with EVs. Uh, I get a lot of software updates, which will improve the functionality of the car, but the style of it and the, um, the screen itself, they, they are sort of, in effect, baked in. Now, one of the things I like about the Tesla is that if I wanted to, and I'm very seriously considering this, I can actually upgrade the software. So my screen, for example, I have a main screen and I have a, a driver display. Um, they're fully upgradable. So I can put it into the Tesla uh, dealership and they will upgrade both the screen, uh, both the screens and the processor and the memory and everything uh, to the latest version. And it will give me a load of extra features, bring me up to date, uh, I've got 4K and everything. Uh, it's a total full update doesn't change the bodywork, it's still an old car, it doesn't change the seats, it's still a little bit worn after nine years, but the technology will actually be a lot better. So 
in some ways you can keep up to date with the technology, but then the appearance goes out of date and it just looks an old car. Well, if appearance matters to you, you wouldn't spend the money updating the technology, you would just buy the next new car. If the technology matters more than appearance, you'd just do the update. So it depends what's important to you. To me, once I'm in it, the technology is more important than the appearance. But to other people, they have to be seen to have the latest car in front of their neighbors or their workmates. Um, it takes all sorts. With EVs being so software heavy, do we just run a risk of everything going to a subscription and everybody just being nickel and dimed by large companies like Tesla? Uh, the answer is, well, it's a strange one because it's a twofold answer. And this is where you have to be very careful with the company that you choose for your car, your EV. Because there are two directions you can go in and we've seen this already for example bmw and toyota have gone down one way and this is where they supplied something for example a heated seat or a remote um a key fob and you bought that with the car and they were available for you with the car and then at a future time they suddenly withdrew it and said, if you want to continue using this function, this feature, you must start paying us for it. And that to me is absolutely illegal, immoral. It is absolutely abysmal. You bought it, it was a feature that you owned, you owned outright, and they decided to then start trying to rake, rake it in by charging you for something that you owned. That should be banned. On the other hand, on this one, for example, this Tesla, what they've offered me is I've got a screen, um, I've got a, a nice display and a display in front of me, and it's working fine, but it's very much outdated now. What they offer me is if I want to do an update to the very latest one, I can buy an update. This one, when it came out, doesn't have FSD. If I want FSD, I can subscribe to FSD. Now, when I came out brand new, FSD wasn't available. I couldn't have bought it at the time, but it's now available. So this is something extra that I've never had and maybe never wanted at the time that I can now add on. So there's a very distinct difference between something that you bought and owned and they're now trying to charge you for and something they offer you brand new that you might want to want to buy. Now, if they're offering you something brand new, they could either offer it as a one-off payment or they can offer it as a subscription. So let's take Tesla again. They offer FSD in America as a one-off payment and I think it's about eight or nine thousand dollars, which is worth it or not, depends whether you want it, or you can have it as a subscription and I think it's $99 a month. But that's not charging you for something that you got with the car originally and they're now forcing you to pay. It's an extra that you didn't buy when you bought the car. And you just have a choice of whether you want it. If you do want it, do you want to pay for a lump sum or do you want it on a monthly subscription? And this is what you've got to be careful of. This is a slippery slope. This big difference between being forced to pay for something that you had and no longer can have and being offered something new that you never had. Well, that brings us to the end of our rainy day adventures. I hope that you have all enjoyed uh, us addressing some of these EV myths, these concerns, these fears that people have around it. And hopefully it's put your mind at ease. And of course, as ever, if you have vehemently disagree with everything that's been said, let us know where we've gone wrong. I'm Jonas. I'm Dave. Thank you for watching.